his initial forces that he sent over got crushed by the confederated forces led by Little Turtle of the Miamis and, and Blue Jacket of the Shawnees and other chiefs. And I think you say it, it crushed so badly that this battle doesn't actually have a name because it's it was such a shameful moment. It was such a shameful moment. American yeah, it history. Swept under the rug of U.S. history because it was, it was this army was destroyed in in November 1791, and you know we talk about Battle of the Little Bighorn or you know Custer's Last Stand being this 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 crushing of the U.S. Army, the U.S. cavalry, and this, that would be a hundred years later. But I think it was something like 200, 200 Soldiers and officers died in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Well, three times more died in what's called the Battle of No Name. Hi, everyone. This is A.J. Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics, Today, I am really excited to have on the show Peter Stark for his new book, Gallop Towards the Sun, Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison's Struggle for the Destiny of a Nation. Peter is an adventure and exploration writer and historian. Born in Wisconsin, he studied English and anthropology at Dartmouth College and journalism at the University of Wisconsin. A longtime correspondent for Outside Magazine, he's also been published in the Smithsonian, The New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, and Men's Journal. His book, Astoria, was a New York Times bestseller, and it received the Penn USA Literary Award nomination. It was an, adapted into an epic two-part play, which is really cool, and I think might be the first, Peter, that uh, we've had uh, on this show. Uh, how are you doing today? Good, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted to talk to you. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, we have so much to talk about, and it was like, it took... All of my my willpower to not just bombard you with questions before we actually started recording, because I personally am very fascinated by this topic because I grew up right next to where the Battle of the Tippecanoe took place in Indiana, in rural Indiana, which of course William Henry Harrison, well, and Tecumseh, but William Henry Harrison, very well known for that particular battle. And I knew like hardly anything about it growing up too. So yeah, so excited for this, this discussion. Have you, in, I imagine in your, your research, did you, did you spend a lot of time in like that part of the world? Did you, did you travel back through Vincennes and Fort Wayne and Lafayette at all in Indiana? What I, I, I went to your childhood home. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was about to start talking about because there's a great, the Tippecanoe River has right upstream from where this battle took place. Um, it's in like the 1920s, like two man-made lakes were, <laughs> were, were created there. And Indiana Beach, an amusement park, has been um, put up right above where the Battle of uh, Tippecanoe took place. Uh, on the Tippecanoe River or on the on the Wabash? On so on the Tippecanoe, what they did is they dammed up part of it and they made it into a man-made lake. And now there's something called Indiana Beach right above where this like battle took place. So, no, if I, you I, write I another that. book, if you write another book about this part of the world, you've got to go to Indiana Beach. Yeah, this this was a different beach at the time. <laughs> a different beach, yes. Well, you know, one of the things that I when I reach out to you, um, so I saw this this book in Barnes and Noble. And I don't think anything has, I mean, I'm sure things have been written about the part of the world where I grew up, but certainly nothing like your book. Um, and I was asking before we went on, we don't actually know where, where this, this photo is right here on the cover. And for everybody listening and not watching, the cover to Peter's book has this beautiful sunset over a river. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, that's, is that the Tippecanoe River? Is that where I grew up? But we were not able to confirm that um, before we went on, right, Peter? Yeah, I, I actually, I've had several people ask me that very same question. And when I see that photograph, I love that photograph. I love that cover. That's such a beautiful cover that I, that was my immediate reaction where, you know, where was that taken? I think I know that place. I've been, you know, I've canoed all my life. I've been on so many rivers and, and I just feel it was so familiar. And 
you know, I was thinking it's got to be a river in the Midwest and where I grew up. And so I think what I'll do is I'll try to track that down and figure out where it is because it's, it's, it's a sort of burning question. And Yeah. Well, we will, it could, you know, who knows, maybe it is a Tippecanoe river. Maybe it, it just so happens. It could be. <laughs> well, that this, this, so this, this conversation, as I mentioned, very kind of personal to me because growing up, I really, and I grew up in this part of the world and I really knew nothing about this battle. I knew nothing about how the the Native Americans were, I mean, I knew a little bit about how the Native Americans were treated, but certainly not to the extent, in your prologue, I mean, you called the the fighting between the the white settlers and um, the Native Americans, you call it genocide. And that certainly was not a term that uh, was taught in my, uh, to me in high school history. So like I, I was born in Miami County in Indiana, there's Tecumseh Middle School in Lafayette. There's William Henry Harrison High School. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you find that most people don't either if either they don't know anything about this uh, time in American history, or if they do know things about this point in time, it's not much about Native Americans. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and and that's what attracted me to the to the subject to begin with. That you know, as you say, a lot of people just don't know. A lot of Americans who who you know that know the outlines of American history don't even register this particular region at this particular time. And what I say is that it's it's you know I talk about it being over the mountains, and you know here I've lately given readings on the West Coast, and so I explained to audiences there well. When I say over the mountains, I don't mean over the Cascades. I don't mean over the Sierras. I don't mean over the Rockies. I mean over the Appalachian Mountains. And so here you have the events of the revolution, the events before the revolution, during the revolution, and after the revolution, which is this book spans the, that that era, and especially just after the revolution. We are so, as Americans who have studied history in our you know regular schools, are so aware of what happened on the East Coast and the Eastern Seaboard on those, you know, the colonies, then states, the 13 colonies and states that went from the Atlantic coast, basically up to the foothills of the Appalachians. And so that's almost entirely our focus in, in that period of history. But at that time, there were pivotal events going on over the mountains, really important events that that would have a huge impact on on the ultimate shape and values and and fabric of this nation and they are just not acknowledged very much in american yeah. history and so i chose to focus on these two individuals Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison because they embody the the dynamics of that era and and they were both extremely influential figures. And I mean, it's funny, like Harrison, now William Henry Harrison, he's known, I mean, he's more like the answer to a bar trivia quest question, which is, you know, who was the shortest lived president, uh, which president had the shortest term in office? As a young man, I mean, that was when his, I think he was in his 60s when he became president. But as a young man in his 20s and 30s, he was extremely influential in launching the Western movement. And likewise, Tecumseh, who unified tribes from Lake Superior all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico to um, hold the land as one and try to stop this relentless onslaught of white settlers. So those were pivotal moments and we're living with the consequences today. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, I got a little bit ahead of myself because, um, you know, we're, we're talking about things um, that, that things and events that happen in the book. But a question I generally like to start off asking people is to say in your own words, what is your book about? Could you could you set the stage for our, our listeners real quick and just say in your own words, what's this book about? Well, I, you know, it's somewhat what I just said. It's it's about the events that took place over the mountains in the Ohio wilderness and around the Great Lakes in the in the era before and after the revolution, 
uh, and especially the events from about 1790 to 1813. And would and, you? And that's that's when Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison eventually rose to be the each the leader of a of a separate movement that came head to head, face to face, literally face to face on the lawn of the governor's mansion out in Indiana Territory, and you know had it out verbally, and then and then with weapons. Would you say that this? Is so the War of eighteen twelve is it plays a big part in this story, but is there is there like a, a particular war that we might call the the events from the seventeen nineties up until you know the eighteen twenties and this this rough well, you, time you, period? You could you could I, well there, you know this is an, uh, something I address in the in the in the book and when I give when I when I've been giving talks lately is that I've tried I've tried to recount that whole history you know and. A few minutes and that that there is a war that people <laughs> most americans have never heard of and i hadn't really heard of it until i dug into this it's called the northwest indian wars or little turtles war and that took place basically between about 1789 1790 and 1794 so the the first half of the 1790s and that was when the united states was i mean it was it wasn't even a baby nation. It was a fledgling nation. It, it hadn't, it hadn't figured out what it was doing. It didn't even really, it didn't have an official army. And at, at that point, the United States, the founding fathers didn't want an official standing army. They thought that's what the Kings and tyrants of Europe used. Yet there were these settlers going over the mountains and, and mostly illegally and settling on Indian lands over the mountains. And, Eventually, conflicts broke out between the settlers and the tribes, and then the Northwest Indian Wars, you could say, really started in around 1790 when George Washington, then, what, what's he in office? 1790, one year. I mean, he just got into office, and he sent he sent this kind of motley collection of you know states militias, and I think there was one you know small body of of actual u.s troops left over from the revolution and he cobbled together this force and sent them over the mountains and to as he called it punish the banditti the shawnees and cherokees and miamis over the mountains in the ohio valley and they were they were based especially the shawnees out of what's now southern ohio and his initial forces that he sent over got crushed by the confederated forces led by little turtle of the miamis and and blue jacket of the shawnees and other chiefs and i think you say it, the it crushed so badly that this battle doesn't actually have a name because it's it was such a shameful moment it was such a shameful moment American yeah, it history crept under the rug of u.s history because it was it was this army was destroyed in in November 1791 and you know we talk about Battle of the Little Bighorn or you know Custer's Last Stand being this 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 crushing of the U.S. Army the U.S. Cavalry and the hunt, this, that would be a hundred years later but I think it was something like 200 200 soldiers and officers died in the Battle of the Little Bighorn well three times more died in what's called the Battle of No Name. It has various names, but that's the kind of the classic one. And and yet we don't even know what it is. We've never heard of it. Yeah. And one of the questions that, since this is the War Books podcast, a question that I often have about the military situation uh, between Native Americans and, and the, would you, I think in the book you called them just like the white settlers, but would I would you say Native Americans on one side and, and Americans on the other side? How would you frame that? Actually, I say before white I... settlers generally, okay. and because that's primarily what they were. They you know they 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 weren't. I suppose they weren't always white, but the the number of of you know freed blacks coming over and being settlers was extremely limited, if 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 at all. And and they were yeah they were prim primarily settlers trying to establish you know farm holdings. And a lot of the troubles initially started when, when merchants 
started going over earlier, but before the revolution. So the battles that take place for the white settlers are either militias or or part of the regular army. On the Native American side, I get, my question is like, how are how are these battles actually being fought? Like, what types of equipment? What types of weapons? How are the Native Americans equipped versus how are the white settlers equipped? Uh, yeah, and that's that's a really good question, and, and and it's a really good question for this for this particular podcast. It it really varies, and by the time, the circumstance, and the individuals. For instance, Tecumseh. Who who really came in to his own as a warrior in in probably like the early 1790s, and who fought in some of the some of these battles of the Northwest Indian Wars. His preferred weapon was the weapon he called it the weapon of his ancestors, the war club, and he could be way more effective with a war club than he could with a musket. And you know you know the reason for that, like your musket's a one shot deal, and this fighting inevitably with the uh, with 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 native warriors would devolve into hand to hand combat and that's one of the reasons that the that the US forces got crushed so often and so easily because they you know they try to stave them off with muskets and it it worked for a minute and then it didn't but the but the indian indians also had 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 muskets and it, it kind of almost surprising numbers of them that, you know, I never, I haven't heard much of, of Indian forces in these battles lacking, lacking muskets, but they also, you know, they had bows and arrows, they had war clubs, they, they had preferred, preferred weapons, depending on the circumstance. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think too, you know, today we think about, you know, guns being superior to like knives or, or clubs. But I I am reminded of during like the Napoleonic Wars, oftentimes like cavalry uh, charges, like the the cavalry would have, they would rely more on their swords and their bayonets because the musket was just wildly inaccurate. So we think of guns now as being vastly superior, um, but back at this time, you know, maybe it makes a little bit of sense why why the the the, the white settlers were at such a disadvantage in a battle like well, and, that. And along those same lines that in the later, you know, this is decades later in, when you get into the mid 1800s and you get into the Plains Indian Wars, the, the Plains Indians could dominate the, the U S forces for a long time in part because they could shoot arrows at the rate off a horse, like at 15 arrows a minute. And the U.S. soldiers had, you know, like a one shot and reload, maybe three shots a minute. And so it was once the repeating revolver and, and rifle came into play, that made a huge difference in turning the tide in the Plains Indian Wars. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about our main characters, if you want to call them that, in this story, Tecumseh and, and William Henry Harrison. I'm not sure which one to start with. Which one would you like to kind of give the backstory about first? Well, uh, you know, it's funny that that I've realized in, both in writing and researching the book and also when I've been speaking to audiences just since the, the end of August when the when the book came out that you know for for most of us don't have native native backgrounds, you know, most of the audience. And and we're kind of most of us, not everyone of course, but have been brought up or descended in some way from the, you know, European American tradition. And so I realized kind of early in the going and the research and the writing, it's, it's easier for the European American mind to get into the story from the European American side and, and then merge with the native side. And so what I start there then. So, yeah. So what I've been doing (laughs) is I like to start with, with Harrison. And and talk about how his dad, Benjamin Harrison V, was one of the primary founding fathers of of the United States. And even though he doesn't get the billing that, a you know, Madison or a Jefferson or a Washington does, he was right up there with those guys. And, you know, he's a sort of big, jovial, uh, boisterous guy and very frank. And he was a fifth generation plantation owner 
in and he was in, at the signing of the declaration too correct that's exactly he was the head of the committee of the whole during the continental congress in june of 1775 which meant he was the guy who ran the debate and and shepherded the votes to pass the declaration of independence so he was like the guy who got it done and so he was right there at the beginning but so he's a fifth generation you know virginia slave uh, holder and plantation owner with this beautiful mansion on the James River called Berkeley Plantation. But then he got up caught up in revolutionary politics. And, you know, once the revolution started, this is again, you know, feeds into your war war books podcast. Once the revolution started, you know, we all know the story of Benedict Arnold flipping sides. So Benedict Arnold becomes, I think he I think he was named a general, a very high officer in the you know the British Royal Army. And within a very short time, he's leading a large body of redcoats down the James River and surrounds Berkeley Plantation. And he orders his soldiers to pull all the furnishings and all the, you know, the furniture, the family heirlooms, the paintings out of Berkeley Plantation, the Harrison Mansion, pile them on the front lawn and set fire to them. And then he has his soldiers shoot the cows and set the slaves free, all because of revenge against Benjamin Harrison V for getting this declaration done. William Henry, he's the youngest of three sons, while this chaos is going on and his you know plantation heirlooms are getting burned up, he and his mom and his little sister flee in a carriage while this is going on. And that's a formative moment of his childhood Whereas at the same time, over the mountains, but actually a few years earlier, but at the same, almost, you know, the same, the same arc in a, in a boy's life, Tecumseh's dad was a Shawnee war chief of, a, you know, a long tradition of war chiefs and leaders. And he died when Tecumseh was six years old. And he died fighting the... British Virginia colonial soldiers coming over the mountains to try to protect white settlers who were trying to set to settle there. And so Tecumseh's father died, you know, on the over the mountain side of this of this uh, turmoil. And in his father's dying words, this father said to his oldest son, you know, I want you to raise your younger brothers as, you know, to be honorable, to be respectful, to be great honorable warriors and i want you never to give in to the whites so that was the legacy tecumseh grew up in and then it it goes from there that uh the white settlers kept coming over the mountains you know daniel boone chops the wilderness road in 1775 and a lot of this happened during the revolution because that you know, it, it suddenly became more of a free for all on the other side of the mountains. Whereas when the British were in charge, they they were they were trying to restrict white settlement over the mountains because they'd, it 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 would cause too much trouble. So, but once the revolution broke out, that there were many more white settlers came over the mountains. And when uh, when Tecumseh was twelve, that. Shawnee warriors had had besieged Boonesboro, you know Daniel Boone's outfit, his his settlement, and they they besieged it but didn't capture it, you know, like it was an eight day siege, and then in retaliation for that, the Kentuckians around Boonesboro, the Long Knives, Shawnees called called them, put together a midnight raid on horseback, and 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 attacked and burned. The, the major Shawnee villages around Chillicothe in today's Ohio. And as that village burned in the middle of a was a 12 year old Tecumseh huddled with his mother and his younger brothers and sisters in a lodge in the, in the middle of this. So kind of in the same parallel universe with Harrison's mansion going up when he's a boy, Tecumseh's village gets burned up when, when he's 12. And then his, his mom decides it's too violent. And, you know, the dad's dead. The mom has like five or six kids. And so the mom takes her youngest children and migrates across the Mississippi River to Spanish territory. And then Tecumseh's left in the care of his older sister and is raised there. 
So this is, you know, these are the seeds of, of where these guys come from. Yeah. Um, which is for, I mean, I think for what makes this such a fascinating story is that for, for a long time, you know, in American literature, there's not been a focus on the origin story for Native Americans and seeing where Tecumseh came from, what happened to him growing up, him and every, you know, as you say at the beginning of the book, these are people experiencing genocide, you know, to, to, to come at it from that perspective is incredibly valuable, uh, I think. Talk a little bit about first back up just a second. Why why are white settlers coming over the mountains anyway in the first place at, at this point? In that's time? that's where the land is, you know. That that the eastern seaboard, take Virginia for instance, and the Virginians were, I think, out of all the you know they used to call it land hunger, out of all the land hunger hungry American colonists and 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 citizens, the Virginians were the hungriest. And there, there are reasons for that. And one is that tobacco is a notorious uh, exhauster of the soil. And so the Virginia tobacco plantation owners were always needing more and more land. And they have, you know, and they had slaves to work it. They had slaves to clear new, huge new plots of land, to clear the forest and to plant the tobacco, very labor intensive. So they were, they were just, just kind of inflamed with the need and desire for land. So they kept the Virginians especially kept pushing over the mountains into new territory. It, it, people just wanting new land to, to settle and to plant. And there, the, you know, it wasn't only the Virginians, but they were a huge, a huge part of it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about how William Henry Harrison ends up in Indiana ter- territory anyway, or actually, I, I guess first he's in Ohio territory. Is it? Is there a difference yeah, well, between I, I Ohio? Can, and I can give you the, the, the to pick up his yeah. biography again because it's, yeah. it's 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 a it's a crazy. Both of them have kind of kind of crazy biographies. Yeah, and I, I don't want to go too a, a long uh, on too long about either of them. But the 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 brief outline is so so you know the the old man old, old man Harrison Benjamin the fifth you know the pastor of the Declaration of Independence. You know, he comes back after this his his foray into revolutionary politics, and you know now the you know the plantation the furniture's burned, the slaves are freed, the cows are shot, the soil's exhausted, and he says to his three sons, and William Henry's the youngest. He says to his three sons, "Well, this this uh you know Berkeley plantation has supported the Harrison family for five generations, but it's not going to support you guys." So you better get a job. <laughs> and so the oldest son, he says, okay, you're going to be, you're going to be the lawyer. The middle son says, he says, Benjamin fifth says, you're going to be a merchant. Youngest son, William Henry, you're going to be a doctor. And William Henry, you know, at this point is a, like a teenager and he's good. And he's a good student. He likes the outdoors. He's a good student, but he, you know, he likes to read Latin. He likes to read about Caesar's military conquest. So the old man packs him off to, at age 17 to uh, medical school at Philadelphia, the only medical school at no- in North America at the time, and where he's is going to study under the tutelage of Dr. Benjamin Rush. And for those of you who know, you know, your Lewis and Clark history, and I love this many roles. <laughs> he's been known as the doctor to the revolution, but he, he's a real character. And so the, in, out here, you know, I'm in Montana, but one of the reasons he's famous out here is due to Lewis and Clark, and he was the inventor of what the medicine that Lewis and Clark carried. It was called, they they were the infamous thunderclapper pills, and they were a purgative of astounding strength based on mercury. And so that's one reason that modern archaeologists have been able to find Lewis and Clark campsites in along their trail is that they can eventually they can find the trace mercury metals where the latrines were and because thanks to I've, Dr. Rush thunderclapper. I read that and I was like, well if that gives anybody a sense of what what medicine was like at this point I, in oh time. <laughs> and yeah, and you can imagine William Henry was not all that much into the medicine because Dr. Rush was trained in like kind of the old school from Edinburgh really kind of a medieval school of medicine, which was, you know, ways to balance the body's humors, which you did through bloodletting 
and through purgatives and, you know, various emetics. And then you would measure the discharges, you know, and weigh them. And so it was like, William Henry gets to medical school and think, you know, I'm not sure this is what I want to be doing, <laughs> you know, measuring and weighing all these excretions, you know, the rest of my life. And at that, just at that time, the old man dies. And then William Henry drops out. He's 17 going on 18. And a family friend, uh, Edmund Randolph, is just been named the first attorney general of the United States and offers, uh, this is in, of course, the capital that is in Philadelphia. Everybody's wandering around the streets there after the revolution. And Edmund Randolph offers William Henry a job in the first uh, U.S. attorney's office, which is like a bare room with a desk. And and William Henry says, nah, I don't think this is for me. And then William Henry runs into Light, uh, Light Horse Harry Lee, you know, another revolutionary hero and buddy of his father, who says, well, hey, if you're looking for action, you should go over the mountains and, and um, you know, there's some Indian fighting going on over there. And so William Henry decides he's going to join the, you know, what's not even the U.S. Army. It's a military kind of early. Like the party. Legion of, the and, Legion of um, something. What is it? Oh, it's uh, called a Legion, Legion of the United right? States. Legion, Legion of the United States, yeah. And, and uh, but he's a Virginia gentleman, and, you know, he, he only rides horses. You know, he doesn't want to be a foot soldier. He wants to be an officer, but he's 18. And the rule says you have to be 20 to be an officer in the, in, you know, in this force. And so it's not quite clear how he does it, but he gets in touch with his father's old roommate from the Continental Congress, who happens to be now president of the United States, uh, George Washington. And he gets like George Washington to sign off on his fake ID, you know, so he could be an officer at, at a age 18. He's named an ensign, goes over the mountains and ends up in Fort Washington, which is now Cincinnati, where which is way out in the wilderness at that point. And that's was kind of the epicenter of where these these expeditions were launched to go punish the banditti. Yeah. And William Henry Harrison throughout, throughout your book. So not that there's like a, you know, there's a good guy and a bad guy, but William Henry Harrison is, is more villainous in this story than most people would probably think. Can, what, what do we know about like his personality? Was, was he a jerk? Like what, how did he? That's that's the distressing thing. He seems like a fun guy, actually, but yeah. also very clever and 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 slick when he had to be. And so he he seemed like this genial guy and, you know, kind of fairly easygoing. However, he was extremely ambitious. I mean, it was like he wanted to recapture the glory that his father had as a founding father. And so he was very ambitious. And that's one of the one of the problems was that. So he he joined this early military operation in the Northwest Indian Wars. But then when those Indian Wars ended in 1794, with what's called the Battle of Fallen Timbers, and that's when Washington uh, appointed Mad Anthony Wayne, you know, these are all revolutionary guys, to really train a U.S. force and to fight Indians. And Mad Anthony realized, you know, he said, hey, guys, uh, don't even think about the musket thing. Whatever's going to, this is going to be up close, hand to hand fighting. So you better get used to it. And so he, Wayne trained them in, in, you know, like real serious bayonet fighting. Wayne's forces beat the Indian forces at the, defeated them at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, 1794. Then the, there was a major peace then, the Treaty, uh, the Treaty of Greenville, 1795 which drew a line down what's basically the middle of Ohio, you know, it's going to end all wars forever. And it, white settlers on the east side of the line, Indians on the Indian tribes on the west side. And at that point, William Henry, who had, was an aide de camp to Matt Anthony, realized his, his career prospects had just kind of fallen through the floor because the army was being disbanded and he had no real career prospects with the army. So he became enmeshed in, in, in uh, or joined territorial politics. And that whole region had been named the Northwest Territory. So he became a young delegate 
from the Northwest Territory to Congress in 1800. And then, uh, and he, and he, he uh, proposed and helped get passed a very important land law, Harrison Land Law, of 1800, convincing that it, he helped convince Congress to sell, you know, land taken from the Indians to little yeoman farmers rather than to big sell it in big chunks to Eastern investors. And then at that point, uh, Jefferson came into office, and Jefferson. Uh, Harrison was it were ended up being a Jefferson territorial governor for what was called the Indiana Territory because Ohio had split off, so now Indiana Territory would be Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, part of Minnesota. So he's age twenty seven, and he becomes the territorial governor of of uh, Indiana Territory, and then that's where the trouble begins. Yeah. And um, Thomas Jefferson, um, too, more of a villainous role. You know, J- Thomas Jefferson, like the more the more I learn about kind of like his his darker sides, you know, it, it's it's very hard to, you know, he's a founding father. And this is a conversation that recently has been going on all across this country, of course, is like some of these darker sides to our founding fathers. And he was he was obsessed with kicking Native Americans off that land. And him and William Henry Harrison, he's at one point he's like writing secret letters to William Henry Harrison, instructing him how to kick or how to trick the the Native Americans and how to get them off this land. Can you talk a little bit about Thomas Jefferson no, and the role oh, that he plays in your absolutely. story. Yeah, and 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 you're, I mean, you're so right, and that that Thomas Jefferson has been a hero of mine for a long time, and still is, and you know, in in many ways, um, not all of Thomas Jefferson, part of Thomas Jefferson, I think, is this, you know, really great heroic figure with you know enlightenment values and and a very broad visionary outlook on 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 the world and on what the U.S. might be. But he also had this side that was really self-interested. All these founding fathers did. And, I, you know, I try to make that point that that every one of them whom I've gone into in depth, and, and I, I know a lot about George Washington now, and I know a good a bit about Thomas Jefferson, that they they were amazing guys in, in, in their courage for, st- you know, putting themselves out there and in, in starting the revolution. And, you know, they were, it was could be a dead end really quickly and they really put themselves out there and they, they did so many heroic and great things and, and, you know, and brilliant and far seeing yet every one of them, every single one of them had this self-interested part. And I, in Washington, Washington had a bunch of them, but one, one of the things I really know about was he talked about land hunger. That, that man was obsessed with land hunger. And, and so, and likewise, Jefferson was was obsessed with with pushing the U.S. westward, and so I don't want to get too bogged down in in all the historical politics. But essentially, when the revolution ended, you know the 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 colonies, the states, more or less ended at the the settlement ended at the foothills of the Appalachians. But in the settlement ending the revolution, the Treaty of Paris, the U.S. demanded from Britain and got it all British claims from the from the top of the Appalachians to the Mississippi River. And so there, here's this huge, you know, area claimed by British, but it's, you know, populated by hundreds of Indian tribes. And so the fate of that huge area is kind of up in the air. And Thomas Jefferson was very instrumental in securing that. And, and of course, later the Louisiana Territory but even before he secured the Louisiana Territory, he was really paranoid about securing the westward, the western border of the U.S., which at that point was the Mississippi River. And there was Spanish territory on the far bank of the Mississippi River. And then that became French territory. And then Napoleon was charging through Europe, you know, at, at the, the emperor of France. And and so Jefferson started freaking out that that he needed to nail down U.S. rights to land all the way to the Mississippi River, you know, le- legal 
rights. The, the tribes, you know, technically held the legal rights, even though it was U.S. territory, and to get settlers out there as soon as possible. So in in uh, and Harrison kind of, you know, got his finger in the wind as he was appointed territorial governor, and he's way out in just where you, where near where you grew up in Vincennes, um, Indiana, which is on the Indiana. Um, Illinois border, if you went, probably if you went straight south of Lake Michigan, Chicago, like 200 miles, you'd be kind of in that area. And so he's way out there at his territorial capital. And he says to Jefferson, he indicates to Jefferson, well, you know, we got this line, the Greenville line, where, you know, the whites are on one side and the Indians are on the other. But, you know, I actually think there's a way we can get land from the Indians on the Indian side of the land. And Jefferson, you know, at first doesn't respond to that. And then in early 1803, he writes it's he, he writes a letter and he says, do not show this letter to anybody. He writes to Harrison, do not show it to anybody. Hold it close to your breast. But here's the plan. We need to get as much land as quickly as we can from the Indians. And here's how you do it. You get the leading Indian chiefs in as deeply as debt as you can at the government trading posts. And then in order to settle their debts, they'll have to give up their lands. They'll have to sell away their lands. And Harrison does just that and many other tricks. And in three years, between 1802 and 1805, he acquires 30 million acres of land on the far side of the Greenville line, on the Indian side of the Greenville line. And to make the the longer story short, eventually Tecumseh, who had become a a young... um, the war chief and a leader of a band and who had fought at the battle of fallen timbers on little under little turtle and then had led a band peacefully in the peace that followed the battle of fallen timbers yet as harrison started taking more and more and more land over the greenville line tecumseh eventually rose up and said no more there are a lot. There are a lot more permutations to to the story, but that's essentially what happened. And then he went on this extraordinary uh, years of diplomacy, and and unified tribes from Lake Superior down to the Gulf of Mexico to hold the land as one. So no one chief or tribe or subband could sell a piece of land unless all tribes. All all chiefs agreed to it, and that led to his confrontation with Harrison. Yeah. Well, firstly, um, I was really struck by the the level of deception that that William Henry Harrison used, um, especially when it came to things like like alcohol and understanding that the Native Americans have a very low tolerance for alcohol and um, using you know getting them intoxicated to manipulate them at, at big meetings and things like that. Even though he banned the sale of alcohol until it came to the time to yeah. the treaty that he needed to sign. We'll talk, talk a little bit uh, about Tecumseh. But his, his personality is really interesting too. I, and, yeah. and that, that when, you know, we were talking about when, he, how his Chillicothe village was burned and his mom, uh, uh, his mom left and he was raised by his older sister, Tecumpees, who I think is, it was a female, Shawnee female chief. And I think one of the most remarkable women in American history. And I'd write a book about her if I could get more like actual detailed information. I have some, but it was clear that she was an enormous influence in the lives of both her brothers, Tecumseh and the prophet. And so Tecumseh was raised by his older sister. And yet when he was 12, showing up in their village was a white captive boy named Stephen Rudell, who had been captured by out of one of the Kentucky white posts. And he was adopted into Tecumseh's family and families nearby as a full, full fledged, you know, Shawnee. And, you know, and his, so was his younger brother, you know, learned to speak Shawnee, grew up alongside Tecumseh. And it's from him that we have detailed written records of, of Tecumseh's childhood and young and and time as a young man, which is it's an incredible document to have because it's this is from the it's really extraordinary late eighteen late seventeen hundreds, and 
and that he says, Stephen Riddell says, it comes was just a natural leader, that he was, as a boy, he was always leading the games. And he's a, you know very smart, really athletic, but very fair-minded. You know, he seems like a really fair-minded guy. And the, one of the game, and they're always playing these games, these uh, games that train young young boys in both hunting and warfare. So one of the there, and there's so many things I could go into, but one of the games that jumps to mind is where the the, the boys, the the Indian boys, make a, a hoop out of wild grapevines, and then they they weave bark strips of bark through the middle of the hoop to make a disc, kind of like a frisbee. And then they roll this frisbee disc really like a wheel, really fast down along the ground, and then they shoot arrows at it. And whoever nails it in the middle, you know, it's like a running deer or a running enemy. Whoever nails it in the middle wins and gets to keep everybody else's arrows, which is, you know, it's like playing marbles with lethal weapons. And you know, and you have to make your own arrows. So it's it's you know, there's something at stake here. And so anyway, Tecumseh goes on and he becomes. A, a young warrior uh, with a, a young band. And one of the very early things he does is there's a, a capture of a um, flatboat of settlers and some of his fellow warriors, uh, I think they, they burn, which is not uncommon in Eastern tribes, burn one of the, one of the captives and Tecumseh is just enraged. And he said, that will never happen again. We will never mistreat captives. We'll always be kind to them and so he had that he he brought this this you know real sense of 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 care human care with him and then he then when he became a you know a, a young leader of um of a small band of warriors and eventually that expanded and then as i mentioned that he fought, fought at the battle of fallen timbers where the my uh, Little Turtle lost. Then the then the peace, the Treaty of of uh, Greenville came on, and then Tecumseh was happy to he was he said he was happy with the Treaty of Greenville and was leading. He had at that point he had a band of about two hundred and fifty Shawnees and you know families and warriors, and they were living peacefully and you know hunting. He was he loved he was a very generous hunter. He he was a great hunter and he loved to hunt and give his his spoils to the old people of the village. So that was another thing that was very outstanding noted about him. And when, when trouble started breaking out on the frontier and right around 1800, about the time William Henry Harrison showed up um, in a political position, the Tecumseh very quickly rose to prominence first in a smaller way, but as a, as a guy who was a, a very good spokesperson for the Indian side. So he was brought in to try to help settle white, white Indian disputes on a small scale in, in those first years of the 1800s. And then eventually as, as tensions rose, he became a, a larger and larger leader. And then when the, you know, the, the battle of Tippy canoe happened when he was in the South then he rebuilt the the you know burned out Prophetstown on the Indian coalition. Then the War of eighteen twelve broke out. Then he joined with the British. He and his forces joined with the British, and it was looking like that that Tecumseh and his British forces were, as I was saying, you know they were headed headed east. And at the same time, Tecumseh, you know, as a personality, is really interesting too because I think you know he was. In a way, we might call him bipolar today, which I've written about a lot of early great leaders and explorers, and a surprising number of them exhibit these these symptoms pretty clearly. And that but Tecumseh would go through these periods of depression. I mean, really deep, dark depressions that was that were noted at the time. And he it, it, one one happened when he was you know in his late teens, and he broke his leg buffalo hunting, and he couldn't walk. And he really, you know, some stories said he tried to kill himself. And then another time was in the early going of the War of 1812, and he got wounded. And there were some setbacks in the War of 1812, and he really plummeted for a while. But then he he came back. There were there are a lot. There's a lot of back and forth on the Western frontier in the War of 1812. Tecumseh 
the one great problem was that Tecumseh's, you know, brother in arms, British brother in arms, Isaac Brock, who with Tecumseh led the capture of Fort Detroit, Isaac Brock was such an effective leader that the British brought him back east to fight against Americans who were invading farther, invading Canada farther to the east. And Brock was killed leading a charge. And so now the British on the western frontier were led by a guy named Proctor, who was much less bold than Brock. And and was not kind of was not the equal of Tecumseh in 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 uh, kind of staging these really bold uh, movements and strategies, and so that that Brock's or uh, uh, Proctor's forces, British forces, tried to take Fort Wayne. They tried to take a few other places, and they got knocked back. And the, the Indians with him, the warriors with him, were saying, "This guy doesn't know what he's doing." And we're not going to walk into a suicide attempt. So, so that kind of faltered the British uh, uh, Indian coalition ran into some difficulties once once um, Brock was killed and Proctor took over, and then but things were coming to a head, and one of the deciding factors was is a part of the War of 1812 that, that we've heard about, the Battle of Lake Erie, which made a huge difference out, out this way. And that's that's a huge drama of its own. Really, really interesting. Yeah. Well, let's let, talking about uh, Tecumseh real quick, we haven't really mentioned his brother, uh, his family. I mean, we mentioned briefly, but his brother plays a big role. Talk, talk about his brother. And then I, I'd like to talk about the Battle of, of the Tippy Canoe. The Tippy Canoe, yeah. How they start, yeah, start coming so, into. So his uh, brother, conflict. his younger brother was was uh, known as a you know at least in reputation, historical reputation, as ne'er do well, drunk, couldn't support his family by hunting, and yet then one one day in 1805 he falls into a trance for you know hours, and he comes out of a trance. And he says he's been to to visit the Great Spirit, and the Great Spirit has given him instructions in how the tribes should live in order to regain their their stability and their place in the world in face of all this this white onslaught, white onslaught of te- of settlers and land grabs. And so the brother that who's Tense Wadawa, he's a, known as the Prophet. To in the in the white world, so the prophet ends up attracting followers and tribes from all over. I mean, from you know up in the Great up at Lake Superior, you know down in the south, they they start coming to to the brothers have a village at the juncture of the Tippy Canoe and the Wabash River, and that's the main village for Tecumseh and his brother the prophet. And as as the prophets attracting all these spiritual followers, Tecumseh you, merges a, a in an essence a political movement with the spiritual movement, and so Tecumseh becomes the secular leader of this movement to unify tribes, while the prophet is is attracting spiritual followers to this movement, this revival movement, and. So that that's how these brothers they they work in tandem, and Tecumseh is this you know brilliant warrior and war chief, and the the prophet is not. The prophet is a guy who's you know very charismatic in his in his spiritual way, and and people are very attracted to. Um, the whereas Tecumseh is much more the strategist, the diplomat, brilliant orator. Uh, who's unifying these tribes? So that's that's where we are when when uh, in in 1810. That's where I open the the prologue opens with it. It's jumping ahead when Tecumseh, with you know 80 canoes of of warriors and chiefs, comes down the Wabash River from his his headquarters at Prophetstown, 200 miles to Vincennes, where Harrison has his mansion in the wilderness on the Wabash and Tecumseh walks up the front lawn of 
Grouseland Mansion, Harrison's Mansion, and says, we need to talk. And they have a face-to-face -face talk um, with Tecumseh saying to Harrison, you can't take any more land. And, um, and it ends up being a big confrontation right there. Yeah, well let's let's talk about what leads to so in i we've talked about william henry harrison and kind of how he got to where he he, he was and of course tecumseh you know he's a war chief at this point but talk about like this confederacy that he has assembled that leads to um the battle of tippecanoe which i, I think is in 1811 1810 yeah yeah so, so to come, we get, working with that that spiritual leadership of the prophet, Tecumseh um, has literally ridden thousands of miles to you know he goes up to Lake Superior, he goes up to what's now upstate New York to the Iroquois. It's not just Shawnee; it's Miami. Oh, no, it's not just it's Shawnee. I mean, it's tribe after also, tribe. He goes down yeah. to the southeast, and you know. He's involved probably with the Cherokee, and then you know they're the, the southeastern tribes and the Creeks, and he goes out on the plains to the Osage, and he goes, you know, of course, then there's the Midwestern, Upper Midwestern tribes like the Potawatomi, the Miami, the Huron. You know, there's so many different tribes, and he's unifying these tribes and these leaders in these huge missions of diplomacy. But over just a few years, he covers so much ground, and so this this tribal unity really starts forming and, and, and he's not the only leader, but he's the primary leader in. So, and then in 1810, that the tribes, 1809 and 1810, the, the prophet's town near, near your hometown and the, at the juncture of the, of the Tibby canoe and the Wabash, you know, it's become a big Indian village with 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 warriors and chiefs and families coming from all over the center of the continent to to see the prophet. And Harrison, two hundred miles south down the river, starts getting paranoid that all these people are going to gang up and attack him. And so, first he has this meeting with Tecumseh on the front lawn of the governor's mansion. And Tecumseh is meeting with Harrison to say, look, we're fine. We don't want war or everything's cool. Just don't take this last piece of land that you're wanting to take. This piece of land that actually is really kind of almost a butts on Prophetstown. That, you know, the Indians are fine with the way things are now, even though you've taken all this land beyond the, the Greenville line, but just don't take this last one. And so Tecumseh meets Harrison down on the front lawn of the Grouseland Mansion to have this conversation. And and Harrison, it's a very dramatic scene that almost comes to blows because Harrison says, well, I'll take your concerns. You know, Tecumseh saying, we don't want war, but if you take this last piece of land, there will be troubles among us. And Harrison says, well, you know, I'll take your concerns to the great father in Washington, but I don't think he's going to do anything. And this meeting. It should happened. be noted too, that that is how um, Harrison refers to the president is the, the, is great, the great father. father. Yeah. And he, he addresses the native Americans as children. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a strange thing to read about, but I think it's actually a custom. It's a custom. Yeah. It's not within it, the native Americans invented yeah. at all that, that among the tribes, the Eastern tribes, there were the relations between tribes were often designated as family relations. So, you know, one tribe might be uncles to another tribe. Other tribes might be grandfathers to another tribe. So that, so, but on, on the, 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 um, Harrison, Harrison says, well, I'll take your concerns to the great father in Washington. And, you know, it's clear that he's not going to do anything of the sort. And, and Tecumseh says, well, I, okay, yeah, you do that. And then in the meantime, I'm going to go recruit more Southern tribes. And But, you know, please don't you know, do any attacks or, you know, don't do any military action while I'm gone, he says to Harrison. Well, of course, this is the Her the moment that Harrison, who is this, you know, as we say, this genial, clever guy, says, okay, now Tecumseh's away. Now is the moment to move against these Indians gathered at Prophetstown, even though these Indians at Prophetstown pose no threat. 
Uh, I mean, they, you know, he thinks they does. They do. And he writes to now President Madison and he says, I, you know, I need all these troops to go, you know, to go fight these Indians who are being aggressive. Well, there are no Indians being aggressive. And and Madison keeps telling him, no, just whatever you do, you know, don't buy any land that's going to make people unhappy. And he keeps Madison, President Madison, keeps telling Harrison, just keep it cool, you know. We don't want trouble, but Harrison keeps pushing, 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 buying land, and then sending soldiers up to Prophetstown, and that's where the, the, the that's the root of the battle that we're talking about. Yeah, and something interesting about the battle too. <laughs> they really, you know, this this was the defining. Well, this was a defining moment for William Henry Harrison. Of course, later on when he was president, the slogan was "Tippecanoe and Tyler too," referring to this battle. Because in the the American media, it was really so the battle was fought, and I think that there were similar casualty counts. Yeah, it was like a, there was no real winner. And <laughs> there was not a winner. There was not a winner yet. And and Harrison, in fact, Harrison was criticized in frontier newspapers for being a loser of the Battle of Tippecanoe. Yeah. But, I mean, he this guy knew how to spin. I mean, he was an early champion of spinner. <laughs> yeah. You compare it to Vietnam, you're you're like, it's uh, declare victory and get out. <laughs> yeah, that's <is. laughs> exactly what he did. <laughs> yeah. Well, well uh, talk about kind of after this battle then takes place, like what, <laughs> what does this mean now for William Henry Harrison and for Tecumseh? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's so, there's so much history here, as, as you know, that Harrison well, in the course of the Battle of Tippecanoe, after it, Harrison burns Prophetstown, the, the whole town. And this is while Tecumseh's away. But Tecumseh quickly rebuilds his coalition. And and the, and Harrison is, you know, kind of reassumes his governorship. And at that point, you know, Things are getting tenser and tenser between Tecumseh and Harrison, but just then the War of 1812 breaks out. And Harrison immediately tries to get himself appointed like the head of the, you know, the forces in the Northwest. And meanwhile, Tecumseh, who's been talking to the British in Canada for, for some time, makes an, a formal alliance with the British in Canada based at Fort Malden, which is across the Detroit River from from Fort Detroit, and and some of the really cool stuff that happened that, that we don't really hear about. I mean, you know, as you know, the War of eighteen twelve does not figure large in the American popular consciousness. It's like kind of what happened. Well, the Capitol got burnt, and you know, there was the Star Spangled Banner lyrics. That's about the two things that people know. Yeah. And it's... yet, on the Western frontier, a lot was going on that was really important. And so the, one of the things that I think is so cool is that, of course, the, you know, the British had taken over Canada from the French and you had all the, the, the voyageurs up there and you had all the, the, the trading canoes, you know, the, the big, uh, those huge birch bark canoes. And so there was an extremely fast communication system up in Canada, you know, through the Great Lakes by canoe. And so, you know, Madison and Congress declare war of like, I don't know, it's June 17th or something of, of 1812. And it takes weeks for the word to get out to the, you know, to the to the U.S. frontier. But it races up the word, the message that the U.S. has declared war on Britain races by these giant voyageur canoes out to Great Lakes and up to the all the way to Lake Superior and Lake Huron. and the there's the kind of primary American fort there is at Mackinac Island at the at the head of those two lakes. And there's a British post nearby and but the British get word that the US has just declared war on on Britain. And so the Britain com, uh, forces combine with Indian forces and they do a secret midnight attack. They never even fire a gun because there was no hope for the Americans on Fort Mackinac, Fort Mackinac. And so Fort Mackinac falls. And that, so that's the first British U.S. post to fall in the West. Soon after that, Tecumseh and a British general, um, Isaac Brock, who's a very 
bold kind of swashbuckling British general, launch an attack on Fort Detroit, which is a huge, you know, very significant, you know, it's probably the most significant Western outpost of the U.S. And they capture Fort Detroit. And so Fort Detroit falls. And then the, the, the post that's at what we now call Chicago was the Chicago Portage, um, Fort Dearborn, then that is attacked by Indian forces. So that falls. And so within the first, you know, that summer of 1812, the major U.S. outposts on the Western frontier are falling one by one to the combined Indian and British forces. And they, that, it, the, U, the U.S. on the East Coast, it starts freaking out that it's like the back door has been sprung open to the nation from the West with these British and Indian forces closing in from the, from the West on, on the, on the, you know, the little tiny United States that really doesn't go much farther than Ohio. It's a big yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah. And for the United States, for the war of 1812, something that most people don't know is the United States for most of it did really horribly. Like they were, they were losing battles all over the place. Yeah. Really? Well, well, yeah. yeah. So Tecumseh's last kind of his, how does his like last stand? Uh, I know that's maybe a, a reference to later in history, but how does, you know, what's, t- what's Tecumseh die fighting for? Well, and so the, the, the battle of Lake Erie is essentially a battle between U S warships and British warships on Lake Erie. And again, it looked like the British had won and the Americans were done. And, but it was, you know, um, Commodore uh, Perry, who, you know, comes out in a rowboat with a flag that says, don't give up the ship and, you know, has one ship left and they managed to defeat the British fleet. And, and at that point, Tecumseh and his, his, you know, he has thousands of warriors and families gathered with him near the British Fort Malden, near in that Detroit area, Detroit River area. And they're awaiting the outcome of this battle of Fort, of, of, Battle of Lake Erie, and that it's not clear what the outcome is, and they don't get word, and they don't get word, and then the British, who are at at their their outpost Fort Malden, right in that area, led by Proctor, this guy who's not as bold as as Brock. One day, you know, they're waiting to get word that the the native forces are getting to waiting to get word what happened at the Battle of Lake Erie. And one day Proctor starts packing up his, his suitcases and the British start packing up their fort and knocking down the walls. And it turns out the British have lost the Battle of Lake Erie and they are now giving up that whole Western frontier to the Americans. And they're just walking away from it, even though they would pledged to the tribes, we're here to help you and we'll, you know, we'll take this, these Western lands. And so Proctor and his British forces literally march inland and the, the native forces and Tecumseh, are, you know, there are these speeches, powerful speeches. What are you doing? You know, that we're here to, you know, make a stand, you know, on and on. And why are you leaving? And so then they, the Proctor says, okay, well, here's the deal. We'll, we'll retreat inland up the Thames river, whatever it is, 50 or 60 miles and then we'll we'll set up a fort there, a barrier there, and then we'll confront the American forces there. And so that kind of unfolds, and they thousands of Indians and families and warriors and and British soldiers march up to this place on the Thames River. Meanwhile, William Henry Harrison lands like five thousand troops on the Canadian shore and starts marching up the Thames River. The British really give it no effort whatsoever. They set up one little cannon in one road, and while Tecumseh and his Indian warriors are setting up a line in the woods and the swamps, and what happens is Harrison with thousands of Kentuckians and other soldiers on horses comes in, and the British don't even fire a shot from their cannon, and they turn and run, and that the Kentuckians under Harrison uh, go out to the woods and swamps and on horses, and they eventually get to Tecumseh and his forces. And Tecumseh shot and killed in, at that point. And the battle is called the Battle of the Thames. <laughs> 
And does William Henry Harrison, does he have any reaction to Tecumseh's uh, being killed? Do we know anything about? Oh yeah, that, I, about that's him? a good question. Well, he 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 was very celebratory about it for sure, and and you know he'd been searching for glory the, his whole life. There are a lot of stories about what happened to Tecumseh and his body, and would, would, actually, did he really die? You know, there there are some of these stories that oh, he actually survived and went on to lead, you know, in a more secret way. There are stories about how his body was, was you know, pieces of skin stripped off and made into razor strops and, you know, all sorts of stories. And it's not quite clear who, who killed him, that there was a, one guy, uh, uh, Richard Mentor Johnson, who I think he later became vice president or ran. I, I'm trying to think. He, he became a politician, but, but he used... He claimed to have killed Tecumseh and used that to ride to political fame. And at the same time, Harrison, years later, used the um, it, it, that like well, that he had Tecumseh's death of Tecumseh sort of a feather in his hat. And he also used the Battle of Tippecanoe in what was considered the first pres- modern fre- presidential campaign in 1840. So this is like you know almost three decades later that Harrison portrayed himself as a huge hero of the. Battle of Tippecanoe, of which he was not, and and uh, he also managed to, you know, it's kind of classic political uh, posturing. His opponent, I think Martin Van Buren, was trying to portray Harrison as this backwoods Hicks Hick, who just sat around in his log cabin drinking hard cider. So William Henry Harrison just ran with that. And he said, yeah, I'm the backwoods candidate. I'm the frontier candidate. I'm the hard cider and, and uh, log cabin and hard cider candidate. And I'm the hero of Tippy Canoe. And his run, running mate was Tyler. So it became the slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Yeah. And well, we know that also too, and you, you make note of this in the epilogue of your book, uh, William Henry Harrison, true to his public relations the, the the vanity that he had in what he's well known for, or maybe not well known for, but like that bit of trivia that he's the shortest president in office is because he didn't wear a coat and yeah, gave a two hour speech in the nice. rain. And because he wanted to look like he was very tough and he didn't need a coat and he was going to speak for two hours. And then he comes down with pneumonia and then, you know, he dies. And, yeah. And, and uh, which in March and why he, he gives apparently the longest uh, inauguration speech on record is like two hours. And it's it's late winter, so it's a cold brain. It's like March in Washington D.C. And I think he he rode his own horse to to get to the inauguration, so he wasn't wearing a hat or a coat then. And then he's out in the rain, and then and then you know he's showing what a heart, tough heart uh, frontier guy is. And then a month later, he dies of pneumonia. That's the story that, that yeah. more modern research has shown he might have died of of. Um, cholera from tainted white house water that there was a tainted well near the white house so either way the story you know the, it was kind of a karmic justice for for him yeah <laughs> well and you know after you know reading your book i see the you know he was he images was so important to him and as you noted earlier you know he wanted to re- reclaim that glory that his father had at the founding of the country and so yeah some poetic justice, maybe. Some poetic justice, yeah. <laughs> well, how is in? Uh, we're 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 way over our time, so I'll make this my last question here, Peter. First of all, thank you so much for this interview. Uh, very fascinating. Yeah, really fun to, to talk with you. Yeah. How how is so? We know this about William Henry Harrison and the story about how he was, you know, shortest president, and he's kind of a footnote in in like your white culture american culture how is tecumseh remembered in native american communities how is yeah, how yeah. is this story remembered by native yeah Americans? i mean that really good question and and you know he he is known as a you know a great leader a great hero in that among white historians in the 19th century he was known as the greatest Indian leader of the 19th century. You know, this is, you know, compared to Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and, you know, the famous ones we know. So he was very well known in, in, uh, to, to whites in the 1800s, not so much today, but he was always a very uh, prized figure in, among Native people. 
one of the regrets of this, my research is that it, most of it would occur during the pandemic. And so I was trying to get out to the, you know, the Shawnee tribal headquarters in mostly in Oklahoma, but during the pandemic, most, most reservations were just really shut down. And so that was kind of off the table. I, I've, I've since I actually got a really nice message on social media from a, a woman who had had studied under a Shawnee chief and said, you know, you told these stories much like this chief whom I learned these stories from had told them. And so that was a really reaffirming thing to hear. And um, I I mean, I know the stories are remembered and he's a, he's a great guy. I, I really focused my research on the, the documented record of, of the time. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter, again, thank you so much for your time today. Everyone, uh, uh, I'm I'm looking at the image on here again, and I'm really curious. I got to find out like where oh, this yeah, we'll, is on the cover of this we'll, we'll book. Find, but... We'll make that our project. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, uh, Peter Stark, Gallop Towards the Sun, Tecumseh and William Henry Harrison's Struggle for the Destiny of a Nation. Go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library, um, because what? a fascinating piece of American history that, um, uh, that is, is not told often enough. And Peter, um, thank you. Well, again for well, your time. I, I do, I should just interject here for, for a moment I, that when you said earlier that you, you know, that you really haven't heard much about this period or not much has been written about it, but there's a, another a good book that came out a few years ago, um, by Peter Cousins, who's a, a, a good historian, and has done a lot of civil war and and also uh, Indian uh, warfare histories. It's called Tecumseh and the Prophet, and that that he focuses a lot more on the Prophet than I do. I, I focus a lot on on Harrison, but that's that's that would be more reading too. But yeah, you, you know, they're, they're well, I guess you, there, but it's you also very well known. <laughs> You also have to apparently be named Peter in order to write about apparently, this Apparently, yeah. I get, I get all the time. <laughs> well, um, Peter, thank you again for your time and um, um, appreciate the discussion today. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks so much, AJ. Thank you.